Hello and welcome to Rise of Humanity. I am your host, Chris Karamaya. And for today's episode, I'm joined by my guest, Maresha Donna Ducharme. Maresha is a mystic author and teacher dedicated to helping people to create harmony in their lives and the world by strengthening their connection to the divine. She is the founder of the Snow Dragon Sanctuary, a non-profit charitable organisation which provides a place of healing, unity and peace amidst the chaos of the world. And Marisha is also the author of the wonderful book, The Way Home to Love, A Guide to Peace in Turbulent Times. So Marisha, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. So I would like to start by talking about your book, um, The Way Home to Love, for the listeners. And could you just begin by talking about the the purpose of the book, the, the philosophy behind it in your your intention uh, in writing it? Well, the book was, uh, was a compilation of discourses that were given at various retreats and meetings at the sanctuary. So over time, uh, one of the students was um, recording and then transcribing, and uh, eventually we decided that, that the material should go into a book, um, especially as it just felt like uh, the world was becoming more and more chaotic. And so we spent a lot of time uh, putting everything together. And what I found as I was putting it together was that all of the different discourses and talks were, were meant to help people uh, find a way to be more balanced and peaceful within. Um, but what I found as I looked through everything was that everybody was really looking for uh, the source of peace and the source of peace and source of love uh, lives within us. And so, you know, the book took shape of its own. Mm -hmm. And the real message is that everything that we need, you know, we already have. And everything that we want to be, we already are. Uh, it's just that sometimes uh, our unconscious forces uh, are like clouds passing over the sun. So the book also spends quite a lot of time talking about how to transform unconscious forces so that we can go from darkness to light. Mm, wonderful, yeah. And you talk about the path of love. It's a, a big part of your book. Could you just uh, expand on uh, what that means to you? Well, yes. So Swami Kripal Vanandaji, who was uh, my teacher's teacher, he's he's no longer on the earth, but uh, his name his his nickname was Bapaji, and um, he he always said he was a pilgrim on the path of love, and he says that love is the absence of conflict, and so all of his teachings were about how to relieve oneself from the conflict that we create that we self-create and that we have the power to be able to you know untwist those knots which keep us from love um because love is you know it's our true nature i know it sounds it sounds a little trite but it's true <laughs> it's our true it's our true nature and so so really when you um set out to work on inner transformation um it's it's really working on sourcing love what do you think has caused people to forget that is there like a um specific kind of or kind of uh, highly identifiable reasons in everyone or some common kind of theme that running through humanity why why have in your opinion people become blocked from that love well i think that um all souls um who who incarnate everybody's on a different level and everyone is doing their own soul work and whether you're on a a, a new level or a medium level or an older level always there are areas that are unconscious within us that you know we we really spend our lives um working through trying to open up those obstacles release those obstacles open up those doors that are closed 
And so I think it's part of human nature. And, um, and then I also think there's collective consciousness. So then what's happening on a group level in the group mind, you know, also greatly affects us. And I think, you know, we're seeing that now, now that the world has become such a small place and we really can realize that everything is interconnected. But if that interconnection connects us to the, to the chaos, it can also connect us to the love. So I think that, you know, however we can remind ourselves, um, it's really imperative that we do that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, from what I get from what you're saying is it's, yeah, people are at different stages and it's a, um, it's a, it's a journey. It's not just a, Oh, I've kind of, I'm there now and there's nothing else to do kind of thing. I mean, what, um, what does life begin to look like? Um, when you begin to move to those, um, you know, high levels of awareness, when you begin to live from a place of love, what, what in your view is life more about then when you move out of that kind of survival mode? I think that, um, you know, becoming conscious helps us to realize that the outer flows, you know, we don't have any control over, but how we, how we respond to them, uh, we have all the control over. So, so it looks like when one practices for, for a while and becomes a little bit more adept, that even when the, the highs and lows are quite high and quite low, there is a way to learn how to stay in the, the middle point of balance. And so um, things are not so extreme and things are much more peaceful and we can learn how to uh, transcend reaction and we can learn how to respond. And if we're conscious in our response, then we can you know, respond with more balance and more peace and more love. And I think that gets reflected everywhere in our lives. We're always going to be challenged and there will always be chaos, but um, we really can become uh, more peaceful uh, inside of ourselves. But it's, it's all up to us and we really have to do, we have to do the inner work. Nobody, nobody can do it for us. Yeah. I mean, and you talk in your book about how it's, you know, primarily there for practical application it's not just uh, philosophy I mean can you, people when you implement these things that can have a knock on on knock on effect on so many different areas relationships uh, you know careers is that kind of your intent behind writing the book as well yes you know really to 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 meet people wherever they are um, in whatever you know ways they're having a conflict I just was with a uh, someone the other day who was having difficulty in a relationship and she said, you know, I've, I've picked up the book and I've, you know, done some of the uh, exercises and, and sometimes when I just read the words, it helps me to remember. And so really it's, it's, it's for everyone and it's for all levels of consciousness because again, um, I think anytime we can be reminded um, that we are the way, <laughs> Uh, then we can do the work. Yeah, one of the things, interesting things about your book that I like is that you it's a you take a very universal approach rather than tying it to a specific uh, religion or uh, belief system. And you say that, yeah, we are the way and that just believing in your own nature will take you you know, where you want to go rather than, you know, having to subscribe to a particular religion. Yeah, I, I really do think uh, the heart of all traditions, all spiritual traditions and religions are essentially at the core of the same. When you take away the dogma and the doctrine, I think that the truths are universal. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when we realize that you know, we are responsible uh, for how we take this journey, then we can, um, well, then we can really move, you know, we can really find those avenues that we need and that we're longing for and looking for. And uh, so, yes, the sanctuary is for all faiths and all traditions. Uh, anybody can, you know, a Buddhist can come, uh, uh, somebody of the Jewish faith, uh, Native American, Christian, Catholics, 
it, it doesn't matter. The teachings are quite universal. That is, yeah, that's the kind of the binding, the binding like force and knowledge that will kind of bring all of you humanity together and that people maybe potentially can be akin to let go of, you know, that t division and kind of unite in one, one universal kind of um, awareness. Well, I, I really think that that's where we're moving toward is, is, you know the, the the religions are so many different traditions are losing people and um, things are really really changing and I I think that some of our systems you know are in breakdown and disassembly right now but you know whatever disassembles reassembles again and I think that um, I often say you know Christ was not a Christian and Buddha was not a Buddhist the the religions uh, were formed you know, well after their lives were lived. But their teachings spoke to people's hearts directly and universally. And so I think that as the uh, structures, you know, disassemble, I think they they will reassemble, and I think they will reassemble more universally. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. I mean, do you, yeah, about the, the future direction of humanity? I mean, how do you see the phase as a that we're moving through as a whole because obviously if you look take everything at face value you can just all you see is chaos but if you can kind of look beyond that and certainly with the books like yours it kind of it gives people an opportunity to to look at the world in a completely different way and see a new world emerging if you look closely enough well yes and i and i think you know it's easy to become um you know, even depressed, <laughs> uh, afraid, you know, at this time. But uh, I know that I have the choice every single day to choose love. And I have the choice to be grateful. And um, I have the choice to connect to the divine current. And so so that's what I do. I, I, I exercise my choice. And, um, you know, if, if we really are, if we are souls, and I believe that we are, um, even even if we we don't succeed on this earth and you know things end because of of the environment or or whatever our souls still go on so no no matter what our our um whereabouts are <laughs> we our soul continues and our consciousness continues so to me um it's just important to stay awake uh to meet every moment uh and to be grateful and to participate, you know, to participate at this time. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, obviously, as I said, your book is very practical. Um, how can people begin um, the journey to wholeness and inner peace? I mean, um, what kind of like first few practical steps that you would uh, recommend to people begin with? Well, uh, I think one of the first um, the first steps is that we have to take uh, a fair amount of time to go inside to do inner work. Uh, if we don't have a practice whereby we uh, really uh, close down the outer senses, you know, that we stay connected to the world in, then we don't have a chance to open up the inner channels. So we have to begin by being able to close our eyes. We have to begin by uh, becoming conscious of the breath because the breath is the conductor of, um, of universal energy, which is called prana. So we have to learn how to close our eyes, how to go within. Um, basic meditation uh, is something I think that and everyone can can benefit from and I, I talk about uh, basic meditations in the book meditations on the breath and also basic breathing exercises that help to uh, open up the inner channels and so that's how we start we just start simply by spending time within by uh, sitting and even taking 15 minutes maybe twice a day to just begin and then we can go from there because very quickly um, we can realize through 
15 minutes of conscious breathing and 15 minutes of sitting with our eyes closed uh, that there's another whole world, another whole territory inside of us. And it immediately becomes effective. Yeah, that's cool. And so meditation, it's um, really, it's one of the, the fastest and easiest ways to kind of turn off that automatic uh, there's kind of recurring thoughts that can cause people just to continue to play out the same patterns over and over again without, you know, giving themselves a chance to, to, you know, create a new reality. Is that kind of the way that you see it? Yes, absolutely. I, we're, we're so habitual, you know, we're habitual in nature and we're repetitive and, you know, that habitual and repetitive nature is, is our karma and we can only dissolve our karma when we learn how to not be habitually repetitive yeah. <laughs> and reactive. Yeah. And so when we meditate, we break that chain. Uh, we may be having, you know, some kind of an upset, but if we meditate and breathe instead of go into reaction, we can actually begin to transform our karma. It's great that you share this kind of information because I think that's one of the biggest things, with, you know, things like meditation, these practices, it's people, when they become so popular people don't always understand why they should be doing it they just oh hear hear about something all the time they they um hear that it's good but when when you assign this kind of meaning that you're talking about and people you really understand why you should do it it becomes so much more powerful in my experience well yeah i i think that you know it's it's one thing to know that meditation is good for you um it's another thing to know that you know uh, the transformation is up to you, that you know, you're the source of the power and that you, you create the obstructions in your life and you also create the openings in the way. And, uh, you know, a lot of people really don't actually want to hear that, but a lot of people actually do want to hear that. So the ones who do want to hear it um, will be ready, you know, to uh, take that responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. And could you... Um... I suppose is an extension of the meditation. Could you just talk about the um, witness consciousness uh, concept that you have in your book? Yeah, the witness consciousness is um, is a place that we can begin to realize after we've learned how to to meditate and to breathe and to relax and to go within. Uh, as you sit for longer periods in meditation. Um, one is encouraged to notice uh, like the sound of one's breathing, the sensation in one's body, uh, to notice the thoughts that may be coming in and going out, or to notice and watch, you know, whatever emotional currents and reactions are there. The witness consciousness is, however, neutral. So it's, it's actually... Uh, a, a level of our uh, deeper consciousness that is able to watch and observe ourselves while not engaging in any kind of expression. So we're not processing anything verbally. And we're also not engaging in any kind of suppression. We're not holding back anything and overlooking anything. We're letting whatever is arise and we are watching from the witness consciousness as it arises and uh, washes through us um, and then dissolves. And that's, that's the process. And so the witness is neutral, non-judgmental, and also allows us simultaneously to um, reveal ourselves to ourselves, to see how we um, operate, if you will without doing anything about it except breathing. Because the breathing is the transformer. The breath begins to transform the emotional reaction and, and neutralize them. And in that neutrality is where we find those, those places of deep peace and balance and love. So is this... Is this um, one of the best ways to begin? I mean, f managing like emotions day to day, because obviously it's a big thing for people, especially at, at this point in time, being able to manage 
emotions and break out of those habitual reactions is is obviously setting up a meditation practice is a powerful way is that just the best way to begin conditioning that kind of new um new emotions or is the kind of exercises that you would recommend people use throughout the day to start uh, becoming uh, better at managing their emotions well it's a it's kind of a, a series of things that we're that we're really doing simultaneously learning how to breathe consciously is uh, incredibly powerful and profound. You know, we breathe all day and all night if we're alive, but we breathe unconsciously. So learning how to breathe consciously, uh, it, it changes our chemistry. You know, you can't change consciousness without changing chemistry. And the breath actually changes our chemistry, puts us into a different level of awareness. So it's really a combination of, you know, the sitting practice, with the breath and then developing into uh, witness consciousness. And, you know, there are, there are lots of techniques and different things that can help people. I'm, I'm certainly not saying there aren't, aren't a lot of ways that people can, can use, but this way uh, is really about um, understanding that you are the transformer. It's all up to you and, and bringing that, you know, that practice, to your life so that you're spending a fair amount of inner inner time um inner, the inner world is just as as important as the outer world in fact i think it's more important so um you know, meditation is is key yeah yeah i like what you said there so it's yeah you can use lots of different techniques but the the core the realization that you're having through doing all of this work is realizing that you are responsible for your emotions and your beliefs and by practicing this you will become increasingly uh, more aware of that yes yes and increasingly more aware of that and then also increasingly um it more integrated and in that integration you know of your body heart mind and spirit comes such joy and peace and again, I know it sounds trite, but it is the truth. And, you know, we have to exercise it. We have to do, it's like, you know, in the physical body, if you want your physical body to be fit, you know, you have to do some exercise and then your muscles develop and your body gets trained. It's the same thing with our spiritual muscles. You know, we have to engage in the practice. And then over time, we become spiritually very strong. Yeah. And then that gives, obviously... As you said at the beginning, much more inner peace and joy and gives you the kind of a platform to go out and interact with the world and not have it be so difficult all the time. That's that's right. That's right. Yeah. And we're all really being given such a an opportunity to practice right now just because of the chaos of the world. Um, if we don't find a way then you know we will become disheartened and afraid and and reactive and, and the world is uh the world is helping us <laughs> is helping us to learn how to find our place that's very cool it, yes it kind of ties into that idea of using adversity to your advantage really correct that's right without the adversity we, we don't have much uh, impetus uh, for change I don't know why it has to be that way, but it, it, it certainly is that way. And it seems that we can either choose consciousness um, to make our changes. But if we don't, you know, the universe brings us things that are undeniable, which make us change. So I've always felt that um, I'll participate. And so that it doesn't have to be quite, you know, it can be a pebble instead of a brick. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. So like, probably the less aware you are, the the bigger the shock's going to be to wake you up, I suppose. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's cool. So how did um, your spiritual journey begin? I mean, you talk in your book about having uh, spiritual learning experiences from quite a young age. I just, um, you know, I, I when I was very, very young, I had... Uh, really wonderful 
women around me. I had a powerful grandmother who who was a real herbalist and she knew all about dreams and healing. And I also, my best friend when I was like four and five years old was a, a woman in her 90s who, um, her name was Mrs. Duprat and children were terribly frightened of her, but I was really drawn to her. And uh, I found out years later after she was gone um, that, you know, she she was a real spiritual seeker. She had a library, you know, on, on spirituality and she was an amazing person and I was drawn to her. And I was also, my parents were uh, caring enough to send me to church. And so I was able to tap into those spiritual currents in various ways. And uh, it, it's just something I was born with and has, has stayed with me, you know, my entire life. Um, so my soul was, was already, you know, waiting and wanting when I came in to, to find those connections. And, you know, it, it became my life quest and it also became, you know, my life's purpose so that I could share and, and try to do some, some helping with other people as well along the way. And that's partly why the book is there and it's why the sanctuary was created. It's your life mission. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you talk about a, a transformational experience that you went through after beginning to work as a teacher. Is that right? Was that a big turning point for you? Could you just uh, talk about that? It was. It was because uh, that, was a, uh, that was the point where um, I was no longer in church. I had gone to college and I was out and I was teaching. And it was actually my first initiation. I just didn't know it at the time. Of course, I can look back and clearly see that now. But mm. at the time, um, my soul really needed to get on point with its purpose here on this earth. And it wasn't teaching, but it wasn't teaching in public school systems. And so I went through a series of, uh, you know, physical difficulties uh, as this new energy was trying to come in to direct me out of this pattern and way of thinking. And it was difficult because I didn't have any mentors at that time, but I did have great faith and so I prayed deeply. And I began to have realizations. I began to uh, get communication and realized that I really had to uh, follow follow my, my heart and not follow my head. And I had to find my way with what I was doing here. And so it was at that time that I started to get connected to purpose. And once I started to get connected to my purpose, everything started to move and heal and, uh, you know, I, then I began to, you know, experience, um, well, so many wonderful things, you know, because it's what I came here for. But uh, those times that happened to us, you know, in the, in the old villages, <laughs> you know, before, you know, before we were this technological uh, place, you know, there would be an elder, uh, a shaman or a grandmother or a healer who helped people through those kinds of initiations, help them to see what their purpose was and uh, and then help people you know get on the right path uh, so it was a time that was one of the most profound times because I was so young and it made it had a really big impact but going forward from there um, when my next huge lesson came I was a little more prepared because I recognized the um, you know I recognized the setup and so I was able to move more quickly and let go more quickly, uh, you know, into what the lesson was. That's very cool. Yeah, I can certainly um, say I've experienced that in my own life as well with like just with going through different jobs and stuff. Like when, when you're in a job you don't like, you spend months deciding, oh, should I leave? And then you do. And then the next one, it's a bit quicker. And the next one, it's a bit quicker. And then before you know it, it's just like you get that signal. Like, <laughs> signal. It's just like, right, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we, we're happy to make those adjustments because if we don't, um, well, then we get hit with the brick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it hurts, you know, it, it hurts to not be in alignment, you know, on, on various levels. Yeah, absolutely. And then it, 
But again, it ties back into that, this, what we talked about earlier about turning adversity into a gift, really, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And so, how did you, was there like a um, process of re redefining what success meant to you um, throughout this time as well? I mean, maybe with regards to like financial success, career success, all that thing, did, as you moved on from that teaching job, did, did that change quite dramatically for you? Yes, it really did because, you know, I was, I was tracked and I was, I was tracked for, you know, going to college and then graduating from college and then getting a job and, you know, uh, getting a job that was an acceptable job that everybody would think was good. And, and so, yes, I mean, I had to let go of my idea of what, you know, the success programs were and to, to really uh, trust love, you know, to trust the guidance um, from God that was being given. And, you know, it's a challenge uh, to begin with because we don't know where we're going. We don't know why we're going. We just know that we are. And there's so much um, faith required. And, you know, after a while, of course, it's such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful journey to not know. Uh, but it doesn't fit, you know, it doesn't fit a lot of the outer programs of success. But... You know, once I once I worked with that, once I quit that teaching job <laughs> in the school system and let go of it all, then I just uh, really um, I really let it be revealed to me, rather than trying to make it happen. And once it was revealed, you know, I just I, w I went step by step, and I still go step by step, because sometimes you know we can't see way out into the future, but we can see the moment very clearly. So as long as I let go into the moment and be present, then everything, uh, you know, really falls into place around me. And I find that, that peace. And I find great joy in allowing it to be revealed, you know, moment by moment. Yeah, that's cool. And do you, uh, in terms of, um, I mean, there's a lot of striving in the world today, I suppose, like for, you know, financial success, things like that. When you get on this, I mean, your, in your experience of being on the, getting onto the more spiritual path, is, um, is uh, do you find that you have to kind of consciously think about, you know, oh, I need to make this much money, or I need to get this thing that, or do you find that once you align with your spiritual path and your mission that those things just kind of seem to be taken care of with each step that goes forward well I found that really things are taken care of but because we are who we are I always say I keep one foot in the physical world and one foot in the spirit world so what that means is that I have uh, of course had to meet my responsibilities financially you know to feed and, and house and do, do all of the normal things that we need to do so that I stay grounded and can feel secure. But when we then have the other foot in the spirit world, we have that connection that is guiding us. And as the connection guides us, you know, we're in the right place at the right time. And um, things flow at a completely different level. I, I, I do think that if I if I did not get on to the spiritual path and exercise the universal laws, that I would have a, a, a very good life. But I think it would have been very defined and um, very uh, small. <laughs> and, you know, in the spirit world, God wants to use us. And so when, when we open to that guidance, um, we're used in various ways and we're put into circumstances that we possibly never would have created for ourselves. So our lives then can get very, very big. And um, if we follow, you know, if we follow the signs and the signals, uh, then a lot of the worldly things tend to take care of themselves. You know, when the sanctuary was being, um, when I first found Snow Dragon Mountain, um, I was guided here through a series of events. This was not something I thought of <laughs> myself at all. 
And um, I was drawn to the mountain. I, I was drawn to the land. I knew uh, that I was supposed to buy that land, and I knew I was supposed to, uh, you know, build a sanctuary as it was revealed to me. And I remember at one point just saying, uh-oh, <laughs> because I didn't have any idea how I was going to do it. Um, I didn't have the money. I, I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of things, but I just put one foot in front of the other and I did what I was told. And, you know, the, the resources came. Uh, of course, the responsibility came with the resources um, to get the, get the land and then to build, you know, the sanctuary houses and to do all the things that we've been doing. So it takes a lot of faith, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that comes up for me there when you talked about all of that is just being able to balance the spiritual experience and the human experience. Cause I think sometimes maybe when we begin to have all this new spiritual awareness and this expansion, um, there's almost kind of a temptation to not engage with the human experience and kind of to not honor it because it's more difficult. But I think, yeah, if you, if you combine those two, like you're saying, then it becomes, you know, a, a, a fun kind of challenge rather than something you need to kind of struggle with. Yeah. You know, I know that a lot of people kind of will um, use their spirituality for an escape, but really it's anything but that. It's, uh, it's being responsible, it's being present, you know, it's, uh, it's meeting whatever life brings to us with acceptance and willingness. And sometimes, sometimes that's just plain hard work. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we're here for a reason, so you might, it's best just to get on with what you've got and uh, do what you can to uh, progress as quickly mm -hmm. as possible and just enjoy the experience, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So um, could you... Just talk about um, a bit about the Snow Dragon Sanctuary and uh, what you what you've created there and what it's for. Yes, uh, so the the snow, snow Dragon is the name of the mountain, and the sanctuary is a it's really a contemplative retreat center. Um, it's for all faiths and all traditions, and we I do a lot of one on one work with people. Um, we also have classes uh, on meditation and sacred movement, and we also do retreats so that people have a chance to, you know, unplug from their regular habitual kind of routines and then can start that inner journey. And so it's, it's a place where you connect with your own soul and also the, the beauty and the healing of nature. And so do you do, you do like... Um like specific kind of time frame, like seven day, like retreat or event, things like that? Or is it just, can you just come for a day or how does that look? Well, it looks up. There are many different options. You know, we, we've done lots of retreats that were, you know, 10 day retreats, two week retreats. Uh, we've done lots of weekend retreats. Uh, sometimes people will come and just, you know, spend a little time on their own, just in rest and renewal. Uh, or you can come and take a class. So it's uh, kind of at different levels. And yeah, I suppose, I mean, definitely for the, um, I mean, even for a day can benefit. I suppose one of the things that, great things about a, a retreat is like, as you said, it gives you, it provides a opportunity to kind of forget who you are, like in terms of like all the habits and stuff that you've, you've uh, kind of taken on and all the, material things and everything that kind of you use to identify yourself does that having that retreat kind of give an opportunity for that to to let go of that temporarily absolutely you know people can let go of their you know most people day in and day out do very similar things and uh you know whether it's taking care of the children or going to work or whatever it is the routine it's, it's such a routine and you know when you go on retreat you really get a chance to to break that routine and to be able to feel yourself at a different different level. So it's really a gift that people should give each other or give to themselves, I mean, all of the time. People are attempting it when they go on vacation, but but they're attempting it, but 
it gets confused because they think then that they're supposed to have a good time and so then they look for outer stimulus. But, you know, the idea of vacation is it's on the right track. It's just gotten a little mixed up. But uh, a real retreat will be very nourishing and, you know, nurturing for the body and the soul. Mm, absolutely. And um, I've got listeners from a lot of different countries. So someone might be inspired to come to the uh, Snow Dragon to check that out. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So um, what does the uh, future hold for you then? I mean, obviously, I know you said you tend to take things one step at a time, but do you have any plans to uh, move to new plans or write more books or anything like that? What does the future look like for you? Yeah, the few, I know one of the things that's going to be happening is that I'm going to be writing a lot. Um, I've, I've been a writer for many, many years, and uh, now that the first book has actually, you know, come in and taken shape, I, I'm, I'm in a new current where uh, book two will be happening in the next year, and then there are several other books that are waiting to come through. So I'm going to be really focusing a lot of, of time on uh, on writing and then getting getting you know the, the messages out. Wonderful. And um, mm -hmm. would you like to just share them where the listeners can find out more about you? Sure. Um, so you can go to my website, which is Marisha Ducharme.com, and that's M A R E S H A D U C H A R M E dot com. Uh, the book you can also uh, buy go to the website you can buy it right on amazon and uh, the book is the way home to love a guide to peace in turbulent times and if you go onto the website you can also join our mailing list um there's a prompt right there just send in your information and we'll send out uh, all the blog articles we publish uh, about every three to four weeks uh, a new a new message so that's another way to stay connected Awesome. And I'll um, put the links for that in the show notes as well so the listeners can uh, can connect with that easily. Great. That's, thank you. Awesome. So, yeah, just um, say thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great talk. And thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom today. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. So that's all for today. Thank you to all of the listeners for tuning in i hope you've enjoyed this talk and gotten some great takeaways from it and i will put the links in the uh, show notes so you can check out marisha's work so that is all for today i'll catch you all next time take care bye bye <laughs>